Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel. This is Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I'm, I'm in my office here at the University of Notre Dame, and I'm here with uh, my friend and co-worker on Exploring the Quran and the Bible, Hassan. Uh, good to be with you, Hassan. Thanks for having me on, Gabriel. So some of you may remember Hassan from a few earlier episodes. In this episode, we're going to speak about a fascinating and really important uh, chapter of the Quran, uh, a chapter or Surah 19, Surah of Medium. Uh, and we will be uh, discussing, uh, we'll have a few remarks about why this is fascinating and important generally, but we're going to focus on the early part of uh, Surah of Medium, which uh, addresses both the proclamation to Zechariah of the birth of John and the proclamation to Mary of the birth of Jesus, and actually gives really the only account of the birth of Jesus in the Quran. A few reminders before uh, we get going with all of that. Uh, just uh, friends, um, out of the kindness of your heart, please uh, like this video. And uh, also subscribe if you're not subscribed yet to Exploring the Quran and the Bible and tell everyone about it. Uh, so we'll be really grateful for that. And yeah, Hassan is a graduate student in Islamic studies uh, at Harvard University. Um, uh, I work here at Notre Dame. Anything else I should add about you, uh, Hassan? Nope, just uh, that sounds good. Okay. Terrific. I'm an admirer of uh, your work, Professor, and I really enjoy working with you on this project, of course. Thank you. Likewise. So, yeah, I mean, sort of medium, uh, the, probably the obvious place to start is that it's named after Mary. So that's uh, a distinctive and um, really unique element of this surah. Absolutely. The only surah in the Quran to be named after a woman um, and the only woman to be named in the Quran. Right. Exactly. So other women in the Quran are named uh, by the relation to, um, for example, uh, their husbands. So we have Imra at Imran, or we have the Queen of Sheba mentioned by a title, but Mary is the only one who is mentioned by name. Uh, and I mean, also, we might already sort of anticipate something that could come up later, which is um, because of the nature of the speech between the Spirit of God and Mary in this surah, uh, there is some speculation in the Islamic tradition that um, that Mary might be, um, in fact, a prophet or prophetess. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, I think it's a minority position, right? Yeah, just uh, a few commentators take the position. I think Ibn Hazm is a notable one that uh, Mary was a prophet. But the majority position is that, as you probably know, that prophecy or, or um, that generally you have to be a man to be a prophet. But, um, you know, it's an, it seems to be a very interesting question, which is debated in the in the tradition. Right. There is a verse in the Quran, I think, in Surah 12, which speaks of uh, we have only sent Rijal, so men, as Rusul, as uh, messengers or apostles. Uh, but that might leave space for Mary as a Nabiya. Um, as a prophetess. So that's something that's entertaining. It comes up now and then too in contemporary discourse um, uh, around around the Quran and the place of women in the Quran. Um, yeah. I, other, otherwise, generally, um, and we might note that uh, by tradition, sort of medium is, uh, is Meccan. So um, uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I think that's interesting just because if you accept that traditional attribution, um, you see a robust engagement with Christian tradition and script Christian scripture um, here um, in the Meccan period. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it should be noted that traditionally ascribed to uh, to be revealed prior to even the first Hijra to Abyssinia, right? So it's recited, it's in, in Islamic tradition, it's re recited by uh, one of the companions um, to the king of Ethiopia, so um, and then it's said to have um, a few verses uh, which are Medinan interpolations, but uh, generally, yeah, in, according to tradition, said to be a early Meccan surah. Right. There's that story, which is uh, dramatically presented in uh, the movie uh, The Message. Have you seen that movie? Um, oh, not yet, but I've been meaning to. I it, it's actually a shame of mine that I haven't seen it. You have to see the message. I show it to my students here at Notre Dame. I mean, bits and parts of it. Uh, I think Mustafa Akkad, the Jord was a Jordanian American um, director who did that movie, and he shows a scene in which uh, the pagans of Mecca send a sort of delegation to Ethiopia because already a group of Muslims had uh, had taken refuge there among the Christian king, right. 
And um, I think it's Jafar, the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib, um, right. who is the one who recites Surat Maryam. And then the king starts crying and all of the Christian adv advisors of the king start crying and they agree to protect the Muslims. And so, yeah, important story sometimes comes up in the context of Christian Muslim dialogue. Uh, yeah. Also, I mean, I don't know um, if it's of great interest to viewers here, but uh, I, I believe God is regularly referred to here as Ar-Rahman, which is absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. And it's interesting that the, the surah begins with this theme of Rahma as well. So God's yeah. mercy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, I think a third of the references to Ar-Rahman uh, in the Quran, about a third of occur in this surah alone. So. And I mean, I might say something about that, which takes us a, a little bit f uh, uh, far afield from the content of the sort of, but just there's a big debate about uh, out there among scholars uh, regarding the the use of the name Ar-Rahman or the compassionate for God um, in the Quran, because as you know, it was a common way of referring to God in ancient South Arabian inscriptions. So it's sort right. of distinctive South Arabia that it's just a name and the name for God would be Ar-Rahman, um, uh, similar to um, certain attributions for God, for example, that you could find in the biblical context, maybe El Shaddai or something. So it's just a name, sure. a name, a name for God. Um, whereas in ancient North Arabian inscriptions, uh, God was more often referred to as El Ilah, as the God. Um, and the Quran, of course, affirms and certain passages may be in Surah Al-Isra, but I could be getting that wrong, Surah 17. It says, call on God as Allah or Ar-Rahman, however right. call on him, his, to him are the beautiful names. So um, anyway, but the debate is when the Quran does say Ar-Rahman, does it mean simply to uh, utilize uh, like a, a proper noun, an appellation for God, or does it mean to call him compassionate? I don't know if that may, that makes sense. If I put that clearly enough, uh, absolutely. So. I mean, and it could be both, of course. You know, it, it, um, God's mercy is, I think, as you've written eloquently about, uh, a very major theme in the Quran. Um, in your book, Allah, God in the Quran, uh, deals with the complexities of of that theological debate. Well, let's let's get into uh, the content of Surah Maryam, um, beginning at the beginning. So, of course, every uh, Surah of the Quran, except for Surah the Toba, Surah Nine, begins with the Besmalah, and then this is one of the twenty-nine surahs that has uh, that opens in its first verse with uh, the so-called. I mean, this is the Western appellation, uh, the, the myster mysterious letters, and it has a unique. It's the only Surah to have this particular collection of five different mysterious mysterious letters kaf ha ya ayn so um any thoughts on that the mysterious letters uh and these in particular yeah i mean there's a lot of sort of scholarly interpretations of it that maybe you can um go in more detail about i don't really have much on them myself but maybe if you could just discuss what the um the going debate is in academia about um the letters and maybe these particular letters what they could mean uh I don't know much about these particular letters. I think collectively they're sometimes thought of to be a name for God, one of the 99 names for God. Um, I, I mean, there are all sorts of theories in, as you read in the tafsir or the classical commentaries. Uh, for example, each letter stands for something. So um, like the calf could be karim, that God is karim or generous or something like right. that. Um, I mean, we should record another episode, maybe just on the mysterious letters. There's so much to say, and there's been sort of, I don't know, like systematic scientific analyses, which give sort of statistical uh, data about them. And um, yeah, I do have my own theory, but I think I'm going to resist the temptation of <laughs> boring everyone with it now or bore people with it later. So yeah, and then after that, um, a sort of medium uh, enters, I mean, I'll just read Kara'i. This is Kara'i's translation of um, verse two. This is an account of your Lord's mercy, as you mentioned, opening with this reference to mercy on his servant Zechariah. Um, just a little bit further, when he called out to his Lord with a secret cry, he said, my Lord, indeed my bones have become feeble and my head has turned white with age. Yet never have I, my Lord, been disappointed in supplicating you. Okay, so really interesting, this figure comes on the stage here, 
in, if we can th speak in theatrical terms, in uh, sort of medium, uh, could, I mean, what, what do you think people should know about Zechariah? Who is Zechariah? Um, yeah, how does he appear in the Bible? Well, it's interesting. Um, the word here, zikru, um, maybe we can, so um, it, it has sort of a, a plethora of meanings, right? So um, it can mean mention, and other translators tend to say a mention or an account. Right. Could um, I have an account? So that, an that, account, right? An account is a translation of the Arabic word dhikru, which right. can mean a remembrance, a mention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it could also mean um uh remember, right? Like sorry, we, we just went over a remembrance and a mention, but I, I think it's important to note that you know there's a little bit of uh ambiguity. Uh, in you the mean whether in, it's in the referring era. explicitly readers to something to the biblical account, right? Exactly, or whether it's merely uh, a command to uh, or an account of something new. No, I think there's something to that because later on, I think, in yeah, it says remember have, or mention in the book, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then I mean, just back to Zechariah, um. Uh, Zechariah appears in the Gospel of Luke. Um, how does he appear there? Um, well, yeah, what are your thoughts about Zechariah? What would you add to that? Yeah, so Zechariah is a priest um, in the temple in, in the Gospel of Luke, and he's going in. We're told that he's uh, an elderly man, and his wife is also, um, you know, quite old and right. sort of past childbearing years, and that despite them being virtuous good people, they have not been blessed with children. Um, can, and can we, can we just in case readers aren't familiar with the temple and the place of the temple in Judaism? Sure. Um, I think, am I right, Hassan, that the the traditional imagery for Luke is an ox or a bull? Is that right? It's yeah, it's a bull, which is connected with the emphasis on the temple in the opening of the gospel. At least that's what I've heard. I don't know. Yeah, it's to it maps on to uh, I think a vision, a prophetic vision, and also um, an image in the Book of Revelation. Also with the uh, yeah, but also maps on with the with the sort of emphasis on the temple and the priesthood. Maybe in in Luke, I've heard that as well. Yeah. So I mean, in Luke, uh, I'm sort of going on memory here, which is dangerous for me. <laughs> but I mean, as you mentioned, Zechariah is in the temple, and I think he's like. It's his turn in the temple, that different. Right. So he is. Oh, now I think Elizabeth is explicitly said to be. Is it Elizabeth or Zechariah who explicitly said to be the line of Aaron? Let me check my Bible here. Um, but he is. It's his turn to serve in the temple. Uh, I mean, what is the temple? Could you just say a word or two about what is the temple in Jerusalem and why is yeah. it important to uh, to Judaism? So one note is it is Zechariah who said to be um, belong to the priestly division of Abiha, um, and a, and, and his wife is said to be a descendant of Aaron. Thank you. Right, um, and I mean the temple is important for a number of reasons. It's a center of cultic wor worship in Jerusalem. Um, of course, our viewers will know that it was destroyed by the Babylonians, and then subsequently also by um, the Seleucids. Right. Um, they, they there was a um, by Antioch Antiochus Epiphanes uh, defiles the temple. The Book of Maccabees, uh, the books of Maccabees, sort of go over this. Um, and then now there's actually, uh, from what I've heard um, from Bill scholarship, there there might be sort of an environment of sort of uncertainty about um, the temple as it stands and especially maybe even the efficacy of the sacrifices, which is, I think, hinted here, um, which he was he was chosen Wait, by a lot. Let me clarify that. So mm -hmm. you're saying that, so the original temple is destroyed by the Babylonians. Right. Um, uh, somewhere around there, the Ark of the Covenant is lost. We can, right. We could probably spend a whole episode just speaking about the Ark Good of the Covenant. Good Indiana Jones temple. movie about it. No. And, oh, plus there's Indiana Jones. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so a temple is rebuilt, which in the time of uh zechariah in the persian period uh but i just mean in, in the in the time of zechariah that we are encountering here in the quran there would have been a new temple a second temple but you're saying right. for some jews at the time the second temple 
was sort of like uh i don't know questionable sort of right I mean, sus would probably not be the right <laughs> term, but something yeah it's what prompted groups like the essenes to 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 sort of exit the temple cult right so they uh they go off into the um the desert there's there's sort of questions about the legitimacy of the temple but i think it's also implied uh that when zachariah see is offering uh giving an offering to god in the temple and he hasn't come back for so long uh, because some, you know, an angel appears to him that this is a, sort of a cause for concern yeah, all amongst the people, the people outside, there. They're praying. They're all, all the people yeah. are praying. Yeah. And they're wondering they're what's happened to him. Yeah. You know, because then, it's interesting. Quran, sorry, I'm just going to jump in and say the Quran mm -hmm. itself says in verse 11, jumping all the way to verse 11, this is after he's had uh, his visitation or his, um, his pronouncement uh, about uh, a son. Um, in verse 11, we read in Arabic, فَخَرَجَ عَلَى قَوْمِهِ مِنَ mihrab. So right. he went out to his qawm, to his people, from the mihrab. Uh, so, I mean, we could speak about the etymology of that word, but I, I think that's an allusion to the temple. That Oh, absolutely. And then there's an argument about Mary also that relates to a Christian tradition um, elsewhere that she was in the mihrab, right? That she uh, she was in the temple. That's There's a video on this channel about that if you want if you want more information. Uh, wh which one was that? <laughs> it's Mary in the Jerusalem Temple. Okay, and was it interview with someone? No, it's just I think it's just a it's a talk that you give. Okay, okay, well that's embarrassing. I should know. So <laughs> I mean, going back to Zechariah, so uh, he's clearly connected with the temple in the Gospel of Luke. Zechariah um, is uh, is a sort of uh, in his his turn to serve in the temple, I think he has to keep the incense burning or something like that. And um, in in Luke, he has a um, he I, I, he has a visit from the angel Gabriel. In Luke, right. does he do we hear him complaining to God that he has no child? Does that happen it, in Luke as it does in the Quran? Yeah. So the angel appears to him, um, standing at the right hand of the altar. And he's startled. And the angel says to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Okay. Your wife will bear a son. But to which he is shocked. We don't no, actually we don't hear his prayer. Whereas the Quran, we do. Yeah, I hesitate yeah. over that. But that's a really interesting point that I actually hadn't noticed before. Uh, because in verse 4 of Surat Medium, we read, he said, my Lord, indeed, my bones have become feeble and my head has turned white with age. Yet never have I, my Lord, been disappointed in supplicating you. Uh, I think I read that already. Indeed, I fear my kinsmen after me and my wife is barren. So grant me from yourself an heir who may inherit from me and inherit from the house of Jacob and make him um, my Lord pleasing to you. So, um, yeah. And then we have a uh, direct proclamation, apparently from God, because the first person plural is used. Yeah, Zechariah, inna nubeshiruka bigulamin ismuhu yahya. Um, indeed, or right. O Zechariah, indeed, we give you the good news of a son whose name is John. And interesting, the word uh, for heir here, so is waliya or waliyan, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and that word actually has a lot of, it has quite a range of meaning in the Quran, can mean um, an heir, also a supporter or a friend, um, an ally, right? Do you, do you, do you think that's important to uh, to touch on maybe? Yeah, I mean, the question of heir, I think, is actually is problematic, I think, for some interpreters, if I remember, because there's this idea to prophets actually if right. heirs to the wealth of their, yeah, would it, could anyone inherit from a prophet is problematic. I think this even comes up in historiographical debates around Muhammad himself and Fatima, probably another sure. question. But can you inherit from an heir? Uh, and I think... Um, you know, there's this idea that well, it's a it's a spiritual inheritance, not a right. financial inheritance. Um, but right, uh, wali definitely. I mean, God is spoken of as wali al mu'minin in the Quran, so he is the ally or maybe even the uh, master of the believers. Uh, so there's definitely sort of a broad valence um, to that um, term. Um, I just think it's interesting that we have this almost theatrical presentation in which we have the, the narrator of the Quran for Zechariah says, Qala Rabbi, in verse 4, 
So it, we would put in English quotation marks after qala, right? Um, right? He said that as Zechariah said, oh, my Lord. But and then in verse seven, which is typical of the Quran. And so what people so, some, sometimes call the mantic speech, where God simply speaks with no introduction to the direct speech. Uh, God simply says, ya Zechariah inna. So indeed, we uh, give you the good news. Uh, I think the use of um, of uh, the root ba shin ra tabshir is interesting too. Um, I mean, I know it's all over the Quran. The Quran itself is called the bushra and things like this. But still, uh, I I can't help but think that it's related to um, the gospel use of the word gospel. <laughs> right. uh, obviously, in Greek, it, it's completely different. It's evangelion. But I think in Luke, when the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary, he, he actually says, he uses something related to evangelion in Greek and says, we give you good news of a son. Uh, it comes up in um, definitely in sort of three where the angels, not the angel, but the angels speak to um, Mary. Um, again, it's there. It says, uh, I believe, in Allah you bashiruki. God indeed gives you tabshir or good news. So um, uh, there's that bit. I'm I'm not sure if it comes up in sort of 19 with Jesus, but it comes up here with Zechariah. So um, yeah, I mean, turning circling back to Luke for a second. Uh, so he's in the temple. Um, Elizabeth is said to be a descendant of um, of Aaron. Um, I mean, wh why do you think the temple setting is important for Luke? I mean, why, yeah, why, do, why is this like th this association with the temple important? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of answers. I don't think there's one definitive answer to this, and I, I've certainly heard many. But you know, I mean, the the sort of few I can think off the top of my head is one. It might have to do with sort of Christian theology about the sort of supersession of the of the temple cult um or maybe certain questions about even god's presence right so um if you care if you look at the old testament carefully or the hebrew bible carefully um when they rededicate the second temple the the presence of god doesn't return and i've heard that this might be a theme that at least um uh, luke or the author of, of the of luke's gospel is uh is playing on maybe um, but those are sort of the thoughts that come to my mind uh, immediately. There are maybe other thoughts with, um, you know, the priestly lineage of, 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 of Christ or if there's any sort of um, sort of uh, it, it's often a formula in later Christian theology, Christ is prophet, priest and king. Um, and this may or may not relate, try right. to relate right. uh, well, that as well. But yeah. yeah, any thoughts that you have? I mean, I just it's interesting that. Although it's obviously not foregrounded because we don't have uh, like sort of a contextual setting of right. the scene in Jerusalem or anything like that, but that mehrab appears there um, in verse eleven, and then if I'm not mistaken, a bit later on we read that um, uh, Mary. It's in verse seventeen. So uh, it, I mean, Qurayi's translation doesn't uh, isn't transparent here because. Qurayi's translation is, thus did she seclude herself from them, in verse 17. And um, this is after we learn that Mary is in an eastern place. We're sort of jumping ahead, but what the heck. Um, so the Arabic there is, فَأَتَخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا So hijab, I mean, that's right. super interesting, right? Uh, hijab, of course, people will know in English is used for um, the, the covering uh, for Muslim women, um, uh, for some Muslim women. Um, but I mean, classically, it means it means a curtain or any sort of division. So yeah, it, it's something like she took from 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 them, like hijab, like a, a veil or a cover or seclusion. I mean, I may be pushing it too far, but uh, I mean, could the hijab be a reference to the curtain of the temple? Um, yeah, and actually, some some uh, at least scholars, but maybe even in commentators have have suggested that. And I think it's interesting that I mean, if you if we discuss an easterly place or an eastern place, mm -hmm. could this be Christian. some sort of tr relating to some sort of tradition of the temple being on the eastern side of the of the city, or is it mean somewhere 
I mean, that goes quite well with this idea of this this hijab, this screen uh, being some sort of, um, yeah, being in the temple. So um, I, maybe we should jump ahead already right to Jesus, but just to sort of wrap up the bit on Zechariah and John. I mean, one thing to note is the correspond no, not the correspondence, the correlation or the co-location of the Annunciation of John to Zechariah and then the Annunciation of Jesus to Mary um, is found both in Sorda 3 by tradition of Medin and Sorda and here in Sorda 19 by tradition of Mecca and Sorda. Also, uh, it follows Luke. So, that, I mean, that's super interesting. Again, I mean, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I want to be a little dramatic here. Uh, it's just, if this is a Meccan Sorda in pagan Mecca, right. uh, it's just super interesting to find that it follows the sort of theatrical presentation we found in Luke. Uh, the same mise-en-scene is found in Sorda Medium, where you have this parallelism developed um, first with uh, with with Zechariah and John, and then with Mary and um, and Jesus. And I mean, the other sort of subtext or intertext that people often allude to for this bit, I think you've mentioned it or you referred to it earlier, which is a text known as the Proto-Evangelium of James. Um, there, I believe Zechariah and John is missing. That, yeah, that, I mean that that more or less that recounts the story of. Um, of Jesus's birth um, in, in, in greater detail. Right. So uh, there, there does seem to be something Luke in about this. Yeah, um, even in the placement, right? So Luke has the, uh, the birth of John, the birth of Jesus, right? And, and the angel appears to Zechariah, the angel appears to, to Mary, the annunciation right. scene, right? right? Um, so yeah, even sort and, and, and one can imagine such a structure becoming sort of embedded in the way that the story is told. And uh, there's another point here too, that the stories are linked in at least two ways that I can think of, there may be more, but one is the theme of uh, speaking in silence. Right. So, I mean, uh, I mean, verse 10, Zechariah says to God, uh, give me a sign, basically. Ij'ali ayah. And God says, okay, your sign is you will not speak to the people for three complete nights. So he's silent. And then Mary is told in the second section, the section on Mary and Jesus, uh, I don't have the verse in front of me here, but she's basically instructed to vow a fast for this day. Right. Um, so they're both silent. Uh, after the God speaks to them, they're sort of reduced to silence. Um, I mean, do, yeah, do you see anything... Uh, I don't know, is coincidence or something more there? I mean, there's definitely a lot of parallel structure between the story of Zechariah and John in the first 15 or so verses, and then the story of Jesus and Mary, which take about the same amount of space, about 15 or uh, maybe 17 verses. Um, but also the fact that later on Jesus will speak from the cradle in the Quran, I think is also playing on this theme, right? Right. Where when Mary is asked about what she's done. Um, she's silent and points to the uh, points to the, the Jesus in the crib. Super interesting. And uh, Jesus is uh, created by. I mean, not only Jesus. This is God's creative power generally, but nevertheless, he's created by a word, by kun. Yeah. Um, I mean, at least we get that. I, 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 that theme comes up in the sort of what I would see as a postscript. To the Jesus material. So it comes up in verse uh, 35. Uh, when God decides on a matter, he just says to it, kun, fayakun. So um, there we get that. And then um, Jesus. It's important to know, oh, I think, yeah. also that verse you just mentioned, it's rightly, I think, sort of a postscript because it doesn't have the same rhyming structure as what comes before it. Yeah. So um, it's good. We might as well yeah, mention that now. It's so uh, we we there's this is following the scholarship uh, of Guillaume D most recently. But you, you were telling me before we started recording that it goes back further than that. At uh, least at least as far back to Noldica, if not earlier, I imagine. And right. maybe even there's you know I'm sure the tradition at least is aware of it. Yeah, so the rhyme structure uh, changes uh, dramatically or just very clearly 
um, in the Quran in verse, uh, where does it change, uh, Hassan? Is it 24? Uh, 34, I think. 34. 34. It, it depends a little bit. Yep. Yeah, you're right. It's at 34. 34. I, I had it totally wrong. So you have yep. the un rhyme that goes right through uh, 33. And then you have the un in rhyme that yep. starts in 34, um, right through verse 40. And then noticeably in 41, it shifts back to the un um, rhyme structure. So, um, right. and also what maybe is the telltale sign potentially of an interpolation um, is that uh, not only does the rhyme structure change, but the, the sort of the teaching is different too. The perspective or tone um, yeah. is, yeah. It's acting almost as a gloss or a sort of, um, you know, a, a sort of commentary on what, what's come before. Yeah, that really important point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that I think there are two ways in which the Zechariah John material is connected with the Jesus Mary material. One is the, the silent stuff, but then the other is this, um uh sort of almost hymnic declaration first in verse 15 where zechariah declares about john peace be to him the day he was right. born and the day he dies and the day he's raised raised alive and then jesus as an infant says it about himself right. in verse 33 um but now in the first person peace peace be to me or peace is to me the day i was born the day I die in the day I am raised alive. So, I mean, I don't know if you have further thoughts about the thoughtfulness of the rhetorical construction of this section. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, it's evident parallelism. However, I, I mean, it's even interesting if we go one verse back um, to verse 14, um, right? And Jesus was, uh, sorry, this is John, um, was kind to or dutiful to his parents, mm -hmm um and um wasn't disobedient and it said the same thing about a similar line is said about jesus yes, yes. um i think but around he, the same he, place he and he right yeah. and he's it's the same word that begins it right um but it's interesting in, in the case of jesus it says his mother you know instead yes. of his parents yes very good observation right yeah well okay so um I feel like we should touch on Luke again, too, just because there are numerous parallels. And uh, the opening of Luke is so interesting. Um, I mean, the very opening is the prologue, which is dedicated to someone named Theophilus. Uh, and then we get into the appearance of Zechariah in the temple. Um, I mean, the Quran, I mean, is very different. <laughs> Luke is longer and has more details. Um, but I mean, you can map the, what the Quran says onto Luke pretty, pretty closely, uh, but it's also distinctly Quranic, right? It's not right. No question of, um, there's another interesting detail here. If we think about silence and what in Luke, in Luke, Zechariah is made, um, uh, he's unable to speak. I, I mean, I'm trying to use a more polit politically correct term here. Right, right. Uh, he's made unable to speak. For until the child is born. Yes. And right? then there's that great scene where uh, people are like, oh, let's name him Zechariah. And he's like, give me that. He right. has to write it down. <laughs> yeah. And he says, the child shall be called John. Whereas in the Quran, it's three days that he's he's mm -hmm. made um, unable to speak. And um, it's God himself before John is born who decrees what the name, the name will be. Yeah. Yes. And uh, identifies it. As I mean, this is an interesting sort of twist or a name that's never been given. Yeah, before. the Quran yeah. says a name that will never be that it's never been used before. And uh, I think all you find in Luke is the people around Elizabeth and Zechariah say, why are you going to name him John? It's not a name in your family. Right. Precisely. And, and we know that John was a very popular, popular name at the, at the time um, in the, in the first century. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, why don't we move on to starting in verse 16? I mean, we've touched on some things here, but there's a lot more to say. First, uh, I'll just read a little bit. Verse 16, uh, we have that formula and mention in the book, Mary, when she withdrew from her family, the Qadari's translation is family, it's Ahl, might be yeah. people, um, to an easterly place, Makan and Sharqiyan. And then, as we mentioned, thus did she seclude herself from them, whereupon we sent to her our spirit, and he became incarnate for her. 
I don't know if it's the best translation, incarnate for her as a well-proportioned human. Um, I mean, the Arab, just to read the Arabic there, so you see why I hesitated a little bit. Right. The Arabic is Fatimethala Laha Basharan Sawiyan. Um it's difficult. It's difficult to translate. So I, I something I, like assuming a likeness. It's hard, yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah, assuming for her the shape of, and then I like yeah. Karai's translation here, well-proportioned human. So Wian has a sense of balanced or equal or something like right. that. I, um, I just want to make a quick note, Professor, yeah. uh, before we move on here again, mention in the book, it could be remember in the book, mm -hmm. right? Um, and actually the bridges, uh, so Solomon, Solomon uh, Bridges is in the minority of translators here, but goes with uh, remember. Remember, yes, yes. So. Um, yeah, in the easterly place, you've mentioned this before, I just thought I'd repeat it, uh, that um, Mary is already in her childhood, if you follow sort of three, in the Mehrab, which we've argued is the Jerusalem temple. Uh, and so here she goes to an easterly place, and then she separates herself from the people with a hijab. And I mean, I've sort of suggested, I think it's a little speculative, probably impossible to prove that she might be behind the curtain of the temple, the hijab of the temple, and that the Eastern place would be um, would be the temple. I mean, if that's right, uh, it would suggest, I mean, relatively advanced knowledge of the geography of Jerusalem, because right. the temple really is. Um, I think in both Roman and in modern, at least the old city of Jerusalem, in the easterly place, right, you know, up against um, the valley of the Kidron Valley, uh, right. facing the, the Mount of Olives. So um, I, I almost feel like that's like too good to be true. <laughs> uh, also, but, this, yeah. I, I think um, there are arguments made by, is it Shoemaker and Guillaume D? I, I think you've written about this. Um, of this having something to do with uh, tradition surrounding uh, the Katisma church, um, right, as a, as a sort of devotional place in competition with um, the the church in, um, in in Damascus, was Definitely. it right? Katisma church is going to come up. We can't avoid it in this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to come up. Although I'm I would to your say, point about I would knowing... we're not there yet. I would say verse, sure. verses 16, 17, um, I mean, if we want to map them on, and maybe it's sort of futile because we're dealing with text uh, and not geography, but uh, if we did want to map them onto Jerusalem, I would associate them with with the temple, uh, and especially because Mary's already associated with the temple. Um, and keep oh, it, right. here's a really big point, especially for our viewers who may not know Islamic uh, teaching on Mary, is there's no indication in the Quran that Mary is either betrothed or married to Joseph. So right. obviously that's in Luke. I think, I don't know what the Greek is, but it, it says at the Annunciation uh, in Luke that she is a virgin betrothed to Joseph, a man named Joseph. So that's right. there in Luke, but it's not there in the Quran. Um, a Joseph, uh, sometimes called a Najah, just referred to as the carpenter, <laughs> Uh, shows up now and then in certain exegetical traditions, but I don't think explicitly as a fiance or a husband of Mary. So that, I mean, that, uh, I mean, already it's complicated in, in the Gospels, in Luke and Matthew, because it's deeply problematic if she were betrothed, but not yet married, but found with child. So already that's a problem. Right. The Gospels try to solve that. But in the Quran, the problem is there also maybe more profoundly because she's not married at all. And so, um, yeah, uh, and that's going to that's going to be important to the action that follows here. So, right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So the, uh, it's the you, you alluded to this before, but the Quran speaks um, of the being that uh, delivers the divine message to Mary as our spirit. Ruhana. Right. Um, and yeah, you said that. Uh, I mean, you said. I think you said tradition associates that with Gabriel, and I mean, it does. You, would, you would agree with that? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think it's hard to tell from the text alone. I know Islamic tradition generally uh, identifies the Ruh with um, with Gabriel uh, in this place here. I know even Kathir explicitly says that this is Gabriel, 
and even has a interesting story where when um when mary says you know i seek refuge refuge from uh from you um with the the all merciful um he sort of you know he, he sort of overcome and sort of goes back to his angelic form um from the form of man this is just a story in in ibn kathir's uh exegesis um so islamic tradition i think certainly identifies this with with Gabriel, maybe because of the fact that in 1919 he says, you know, "Ana Rasul Rabbika," right? So I'm a I'm a messenger of of your Lord. Yes, yes. Um, but the text is certainly the text itself is is certainly um, ambiguous. It's not clear from the text alone that this is Gabriel. And then just in that verse, uh, I mean, it's that, what I'm about to say is not actually in the Quran; it's in the tradition or the commentaries. But I mean, he says, I, I, as you mentioned, I'm the messenger of the Lord, your Lord. And then we have uh, the the li, uh, which introduces a subjunctive verb. So yeah. li ahaba leki ghulaman zakia, that right. I might give to you a something like a pure boy or a pure son. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, there's there's a problem here, which I think the text is sort of consciously wrestling with which is the manner by which um, uh, Mary conceives. Now, right. we, we already mentioned, it's actually, it's it's later on in what I spoke of as a postscript, I think it was verse 35, there is the allusion to God simply saying kun, and that's in sort of three as well, that God simply says kun, which could be an indication of maybe a later, possibly Medinan providence for that section between 34 and 40. But, um, uh, there there does seem to be uh, another way of thinking through this in the Quran, which is in Surah Al-Anbiya 21 and Surah Al-Tahrim 66, where it explicitly says, we breathed into her of right. our spirit. Uh, there's actually a variant there which is pretty interesting. I forget which is which, but one place it's nafakhna fiha min ruhina, another place is nafakhna fihi min ruhina. Uh, right. So either mm -hmm. in it or yeah. in her, but we breathe into our spirit. And uh, do you know those traditions, Hassan, about uh, the angel Gabriel breathing into the sleeve or the garment of Mary as the way? No, I'm not. That's I'm not incredibly familiar with those. I know that there are some sort of uh, I, I forget who mentioned this, but th there are some traditions around maybe an Ethiopic uh, story where sort of the, the pre- uh, pre-incarnate Christ sort of meets um, meets uh, I, I, Mary before the incarnation or or something of the sort. But no, okay. I'm not I'm not okay. familiar with. Yeah, I I think this is totally an independent um, Islamic tradition that's meant to explain what the Quran means when it says in Surah 21 and Surah 20 in Surah 66, we breathed into her of our spirit, and it's taken to mean it was our spirit, namely Gabriel. Who breathed into Mary because it's see right. it's a lot of the interpreters find it uh because it would be anthropomorphic to the extreme, impossible that God would actually breathe into Mary. Um, and so uh so you have these stories that either there was an opening in her garment or in her sleeve that Mary breathes into her. But um that's interesting because I mean, already he's called the spirit. Spirit is connected to breath, sort of. Jesus is referred to in one place as the spirit. Uh, and in Luke, if I'm not mistaken, um, the means of the conception of Jesus is that the spirit will overshadow you. I think that's yeah. what Jesus says to Mary. Yeah, the spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Overshadow so. you. Yeah. So, um, okay, so there's and that's another interesting connection uh, with uh, Luke, which I think is pretty important. And then um, uh, in verse 22, we read that Mary uh, goes to another um, Makan. So, right, just remember in verse 16, she goes to Makan and Sharqiyan. And now in verse 22, she goes to Makan and Qasiyan. So, right. to a distant place. That's where we get the word like Aqsa, for example, for Meshtar, right. the distant mosque. So, she goes to a distant place. And this is where we're going to get to the Kathisma. So, this is really important, everyone. <laughs> I mean, if you, uh, I don't want to say red pill, but uh, if you, if, if, if maybe it's the opposite, maybe it's the blue pill. Is that the other pill in the matrix? 
Uh, yeah, the blue pill is you go back to the matrix. The red is you get you, you get, get reality. Back. Yeah, you yeah. Get out. So, yeah. depending on your perspective about the scholarship of Stephen Shoemaker and Guillaume D on the Cathisma Church, um, this is this is where it comes in, right? Because okay, here's a problem: the Luke, the Lucan account, and the Matthean account. So, the Gospels of Luke and Matthew have Mary give birth to Jesus in Bethlehem, and you can go to Bethlehem today. Uh, mm -hmm. to the Church of the Nativity, and you walk in the main nave, and then you go sort of uh, to a corner at the distant part of the church, you walk downstairs, and uh, the priests and the monks there will show you this very spot where Mary gave birth to Jesus. Uh, but in the Quran, um, the birth of Jesus takes place in a distant place. And I think, uh, I mean, the scholarly idea about this is it's connected to the Proto-Evangelium of James. I don't know if you know that bit or if you heard about that yeah yeah so i think the proto-evangelium says it was a deserted place outside of bethlehem or something like that right so in the proto-evangelium um she's experiencing she she says the child is about it is, is sort of pressing forth i think is what she says or something along those lines then jacob gets her off of the uh the donkey and it's um i i, I think it's uh i forget if it's exactly a um uh sorry, a date, uh, a date tree or not, or a palm, sorry, palm tree or not um, in the Proto-Evangelium, but it, it's, it is this idea of a remote. Yeah, no, but we have to sort out, uh, we have to distinguish between two different things in the Proto-Evangelium. One is the birth in a deserted place. Sure. And then two is after the birth, which you're referring to. Right. Just, and I just want to make this clear. You're referring to after the birth uh, on the way to Egypt in the flight to Egypt is uh -huh. where there's the bit with a palm tree. So, but the Proto-Evangelium does say that the birth is in a deserted place. And this is where the Cathisma Church comes in because, uh, and, you know, I haven't read the primary sources on this, um, which I think are in a whole bunch of languages, not only Greek, but like Georgian and things. Um, but the Cathisma Church, I believe, uh, originated. So, okay, Cathisma Church, <laughs> 1992, there is a... Uh, uh, a road that's being built in between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And um, they're digging stuff up and they find mosaic and they have to stop the construction and an archeological team is sent in there. I believe the woman who's in charge of the excavation is named Rena Avner. I'm not sure, maybe someone in the comments, if I got that wrong, can get it right for us. Um, but uh, an excavation is led, which discovers uh, a church, which is known from literary sources. I mean, it's a massive discovery. Uh, yeah. And the road is moved. It's like move 50 feet um, to uh, out of the way. And so the church can be excavated. And uh, be, based on its description, it's octagonal. Um, it is uh, people, yeah, I mean, very convinced that uh, this is the Cathisma Church. Cathisma means seat. Um, and it's because one of the traditions for uh, the uh, for the origin of the Cathisma Church is that was a spot where Mary rested, uh, maybe on the way to Egypt, maybe on the way to Bethlehem. I'm forgetting which one now, <laughs> where she rested. <laughs> but also very early, there was a competing interpretation in other texts which speak of the Cathisma Church as an alternative site for the nativity of Jesus. So, and um, I mean, what Stephen Shoemaker argued, and then Guillaume D sort of elaborated and uh, investigated further, is when the Quran in verse 22 speaks of a uh, distant place, it's referring to uh, the, the, the Cathisma church. Um, I, I mean, should I keep going? I could say a couple more things, but I don't want to like totally... No, I mean, I, I think this is an incredibly uh, interesting part that often isn't discussed. Yeah, and what makes it more intriguing is that there's a third layer of interpretation to the Cathisma Church. Uh, there are some of the mosaics found there were palm trees. And the reason they were palm trees is because it was associated with a spot where a palm tree was located where Mary uh, rested on her way to Egypt, um, which you alluded to. So it brings together the nativity story of Jesus and the flight to Egypt and the palm tree story involving Mary into one spot. Right. Uh, it's the only spot that brings those two traditions together. And um, 
Yeah, so uh, the Quran then has the palm tree story, which begins in verse 23. The birth pangs brought upon her to brought her to the trunk of a date palm um, associated with the birth of Jesus. Whereas in other Christian texts, like the gospel of pseudo Matthew, I think it's pseudo Matthew. Right. Uh, it is associated with a flight to Egypt. Uh, and so Shoemaker's argument is it's only in the Kathisma church where it's associated with the nativity or the birth of Jesus, the Quran, which means, so this is like why it's like earth shattering, maybe, maybe not. Uh, discovery here uh, for Shoemaker and Guillaume D is they would say this means the Quran is aware of local Palestinian traditions. How could that be? If this is a Meccan surah proclaimed, and as we were speaking early on, sometime in the early whatever six tens, uh, uh, a, a, a amazingly far away, incredibly far away from Palestine, how could it have this awareness of these Palestinian traditions? So um, yeah, I guess that's my. That's my long. No, that's, uh, I think that's an incredibly important, at least, scholarly question, um, and and I think a really interesting uh, insight from the text, or just engagement with the text. Well, there's one more big question that I thought we would get at here, maybe two, before sure. we conclude. Um, one is so. I mean, the problem and the tension here is that uh, Mary is giving birth in apparently, as far as we can tell. Um, I mean, she says explicitly in verse 20, no human being has ever touched me, yep. um, nor have I been unchaste. Uh, and yet here she is giving birth to a child. And um, it seems perhaps that she wanted to keep everything secret. And that's why she went to a distant place. Um, that could be sort of the idea here. Remember the narrative turn in Luke, whereby she's, married to Joseph doesn't appear in the Quran. So the problem of her giving birth is more salient or more obvious. Uh, so, um, uh, okay, I mean, we could turn back to this voice that speaks to her uh, in verse 24, uh, but I wanted to get to a more controversial topic first, and then maybe we could circle back to that. So finally, somehow, um, she carries the boy to, the, to her people in verse 27, so um, maybe she returns to Jerusalem is one way of thinking of that geographically. And they see her with a baby and um, they say, Ya Maryam, oh Mary, you have certainly come up with an odd thing. And then they speak of her as Ucht Harun, yeah. as the sister of Aaron. So maybe you could say a thing or two about that and why that's problematic. Well, yeah, it's... Um... This has been the topic of much scholarly and popular debate um, because Aaron, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, Moses' brother Aaron, they also have a sister named Miriam, and their father is Amram. Um, and in the Quran, Mary's father is said, said to be Imran. And like, here, the Hebrew, the, like the Hebrew Amram, who is the yeah. father of the medium of the Old Testament. Absolutely right. So, and then here you have a reference, uh, or people calling her Ucht Arun. Um, there's a question of whether or not there's a confusion between the two Marys, one, the sister of Aaron uh, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, and then the other, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And, um, I mean, the tradition itself is... I've heard a lot of commentators say that this has to do, this is a more loose sort of phrase having to do with um, sort of just her being in some way related to the sort of Aaronite dynasty or sort of Aaronite lineage. Other people, a lot, a lot of times in Western scholarship, um, think that this might just be a conflation. Yeah, so super interesting. Um, yeah, just... Uh, of course, it's important to remember that uh, in Arabic, uh, the word is Maryam, the word for any, for both what in English yeah. is rendered as Mary or Miriam. I mean, that people might be like, wait, but the, the woman who's the sister of Moses and Aaron in the Old Testament is Miriam, right. and the mother of Jesus is Mary. But those are the same, <laughs> I mean, in those are the same words. One is an English word coming from the Greek, ultimately, where we get Mary, and one is coming from the Hebrew. 
uh, and it was just kept in the Hebrew form in English as Miriam. But it's the same Mary, Arabic, it's Maryam, Maryam, it's the same Maryam. So it's a big problem that the exegetes work on, the commentators. I I've noticed, Hassan, in that in contemporary scholarship, it seems to be out of vogue to uh, argue that there's a confusion here between the two Marys. Um, have you noticed that? I, like, I don't remember someone in recent scholarship saying this is just a confusion. I think yeah. the, old, the old school, the OG Orientalists maybe did that. I know it, certainly it was something popular in older scholarship. I haven't followed, I haven't sort of studied it in a systematic fa uh, fashion to see what how how it's changed. I've always sort of recognized that it's sort of an open question, though a lot of notable scholars take the um, take the opinion that it's a conflation, uh, right, Gabriel? Maybe you could you could speak to that. I mean, it's 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 it's. Do, do, let me rephrase this. What are the some of the reasons? Do you think um, either way um, in recent scholarship? Well, I mean, an influential article or a book chapter was written by Suleiman Murad, the Smith College, in which he says, "Listen." Uh, I mean, he's not the only one to observe observe this. Uh, I think it's in a lot of scholarship uh, in different contexts, but that the Quran refers to prophets as brothers of their people. So brother or sister can presumably be used in a metaphorical way. Uh, we know this debate also around uh, the references to Jesus's brothers in the Gospels. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's the argument of Suleiman Murad. Uh, I, the 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 problem is more severe than that though because M Mary is called on the one hand this so okay sister of Aaron maybe you could do away with that saying it's symbolic right. some way because Mary's associated with the temple Aaron's associated with the temple but then she's also um, she's also the referred to as Imran. father of Imran which corresponds with Miriam's father Amran as you mentioned. Um, so you could say, well, but daughter might be like, the daughter might be like uh, sister also used. So maybe there's two metaphors there. But what would be the purpose of associating her with Amran? Maybe right, just that's... next to Aaron. But then it gets worse because Imran, Mary's mother is called Imra'at Imran, which means the wife of Imran. And we don't know. I don't believe there are cases in the Quran where Imra'a is used not as wife, uh, but in some symbolic metaphorical way. Precisely. Maybe, maybe someone in the comment section will prove me wrong. But um, yeah, so it just seems like there are a couple of things that are connecting the Mar Mary of the Old Testament and the Mary of the New Testament. So I would say, like you, it's an open question, um, whether it's a conflation or whether it is like an intentional intentional so, so i would say it seems to be a conflation but whether it's intentional or not i mean that's sort of the the controversial issue right because people don't right. want to see error or mistakes in the quran so they would say okay if it's conflation then it must be intentional and thoughtful and not a confusion or misunderstanding yeah it must be poetic in some sense or, yeah or yeah um okay uh i want to touch on maybe one more thing i mean we're we probably should wrap up soon uh as you mentioned before, just before this bit about Sister of Aaron, um, uh, uh, there's the voice which calls out to uh, Mary in verse 24. I, the Quran doesn't actually identify Jesus as the one who's speaking, and there's some there's some controversy about this. Uh, thereupon, yeah. it, it doesn't actually say, and Jesus was born. So this makes it even more complicated. So... I, I should just lay this out. So verse 23, the birth pangs brought her to the trunk of a date palm. She said, I wish I had died before this uh, and become a forgotten thing beyond recall. Thereupon, he called her from below her, quote, do not grieve. Your Lord has made a spring to flow at your feet. Shake the trunk of the palm tree. And um, I mean, there are different ideas. One is Mary spoke, sorry, Jesus spoke from within Mary's womb. Another is Jesus has now been born and is speaking from below her because she's laid him at her feet. And another is it's the angel Gabriel who's down at the bottom of a hill calling out to her. Um, so all, all possibilities. Um, uh, but Jesus then uh, speaks again. As we mentioned earlier, Mary is silent and um, 
Jesus, she carries Jesus uh, to the people, and she doesn't respond to them when they accuse her of impropriety. Instead, she speaks to the baby, and they say, how can we speak to one who is yet a baby in the cradle? And then he speaks, verse 30. So this is clearly Jesus, and he starts sort of profoundly, I don't know if you have thoughts about this passage, I am a servant of God, he has given me the book, and made me a prophet, he has made me blessed, uh, and it goes on from there. Right, yeah, I mean, this is important because uh, I, though, I, I mean, even in the New Testament, in a qualified sense, um, Jesus is referred to as the servant of God. Um, here, um, I think it's a, a very pointed remark um, that, whereas in the New Testament, sort of these things hang together, that, you know, he's the, the servant of God, the son of God, you know, he emptied himself out. Um, but here it's, I think, stands in contradistinction to maybe ideas uh, or, or the idea that Jesus is the son of God. And certainly what, you know, the, whatever you want, the commentary in, within the same uh, surah, starting in verse uh, 35, right? No, 34, um, will make the same argument that you know, it's not fitting for God to to take his son. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and uh, as you mentioned in his speech there, he speaks of uh, being uh, good, using that same word that was used of John being good to his mother. And then in right. verse 3, I want to speak about this a little bit. Um, he says, uh, again, repeating words that Zechariah had said about John, Peace is to me the day I was born and the day I die and the day I am raised alive. Okay, I have two thoughts about this. One, which is going to seem like it's just totally out of left field. And uh, yeah, you may think uh, your your idea of my sanity may be even more compromised. But the first first one is simply, um, this is interesting because it refers to Jesus, the day of Jesus' death. Right. Right, because he says, Wayoma amutu. Uh, so, I mean, as, as you know, uh, Islamic tradition is Jesus doesn't die on the cross. So any, yeah, absolutely. And the text itself says that we, we raise him, uh, to us, right. Uh, not here, uh, but yeah. and so uh, elsewhere. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting that it could be doing a number of things. It certainly is a parallel to what, um, uh, what, what is said about John, um, yeah, I, I think the tradition has has said that this refers to a future event, right? Exactly. Where, exactly. Um, you know, Jesus will will die and be raised again, um, and you know, I, the text itself doesn't preclude that. But um, you know, the text is sort of um, it's ominously pithy, almost <laughs> you could say. You said earlier, uh, Hassan. I think it was before we were recording, right? You said this Quranic sort of is biblical in an unbiblical way. Yeah, it's biblically right. unbiblical, biblically if, unbiblical. Uh, to use yeah. oxymoron here. Um, but and I, I think that's true because it's it, it's sort of weaving in and out of uh, I, I mean, it's there's some sort of biblical subtext to almost all of this um, or uh, post biblical, but in in very important ways, it's it's not it, it really diverges from from the biblical story. I want to maybe in a related comment bring up, um, you know, when when Jesus says here that, um, and uh, he's given me uh, al kitab, al kitaba. What do, what do you think that's referring to? Is that the um, is is that the gospel? Is it the Torah? Um, there's a little bit of debate about this. Um, in exegesis, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jesus does say explicitly in Surah 3 and Surah 61, I think, uh, bima, or lima, I forget which one. Lima, I think it's Lima Beni Yadeya Minat Tawra. So he says, I've come to confirm that which is before me or in front of me of the Torah. Literally in 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 uh, between my my hands, right? Exactly. So uh, I I think that could be a coherent argument to say that he's given me the Torah. Uh, I mean, elsewhere it does say we gave him the gospel, and the gospel is referred to as a scripture as well. So. Yes, it does say that, um, and I think 
uh, the Quranic language around scripture and scriptural categories is just very difficult to get a firm grasp on. Um, sure. Uh, it doesn't refer to the categories that Jews and Christians know of scripture. So it doesn't refer to like, right, absolutely. the Tanakh. Some people try to find the Tanakh, the, the Torah mm -hmm. prophets and writings in certain expressions when it speaks of like the, the Hukum and things like that, Nabuwa. But I don't think it speaks of the Tanakh and it doesn't speak of Christian categories for scripture other than very vaguely gospel in the singular. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think the Quranic language on scripture is probably modeled on its assertion regarding itself as a scripture to the Prophet Muhammad. Right. Uh, okay, can I say my left field comment? Please. <laughs> and then I, I had I had one more question for you maybe but my left field comment is is something i've been working on a little bit uh in an article that will come out someday um it's with a publisher and is yeah it's been there for a while um but it just uh, i i've worked more generally on the question of the direct speech in the quran and whether the quran is more theatrical or attempts to present that verbatim is the Quran attempting to present what was actually said by its protagonist and antagonist? Or is it more theatrical? You might guess I'm going to say more theatrical, but I just I just think it's interesting to note that I think people take for granted that, it, especially maybe if you're coming from a religious context, that these are the words that Jesus said, that Jesus said, As-salamu alayya yom wulidtu wa yom amutu wa yom ubathu hayyan, right? In Arabic. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, even the Muslim commentators recognize that Jesus in his context would not have spoken Arabic. Um, and if you use sort of more modern sort of historical linguistics, you would argue that he spoke Aramaic, I guess. Maybe a little bit of Hebrew. Uh, I don't or know Greek. if it's that. Yeah. And maybe possibly Greek. But let's just go with Aramaic. So he wouldn't have spoken yeah. these words. So uh, I just thought that's kind of more like a, a theological maybe question, right? Because uh, is this actually a direct quotation of Jesus' very words? Or is it uh, God presenting for us a sort of, I don't know, a theatrical, idealized Jesus speaking Arabic words? Yeah, I mean, this is like, I think, kind of a difficulty on two levels, right? One of them is... I mean, I could see very easily someone saying, well, in substance, he said this, even if he was spoke, speaking, um, you know, uh, Aramaic or, you know, some sort of mixed register of, uh, you know, Greek and Aramaic or whatever else. Um, or that maybe this is, maybe we should take out quotation marks, that they're fairly, you know, they're, we're imposing quotation marks on, on the text. I've heard this said about the uh, in New Testament studies as well, that these books weren't written with quotation marks, right? Um, and at times it's very difficult to tell what is merely just a statement about sort of this person said something to this sort, uh, yeah. or yeah. this in essence and a direct quote. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I, I'm inclined to agree with you, uh, Gabriel, that I, I, I don't think that it's, I, I think it has a certain poetic rhetorical element to it. Uh, rather than seeking to report uh, direct speech. So in my, maybe just a concluding uh, thought uh, from you in regard to this section of so, uh, sort of medium, I mean, we've really focused just on verses one to 33. We did say a little bit about the postscript from 34 to 40. But um, yeah, I mean, I, just going back to this question of biblically unbiblical, uh, <laughs> I mean, when you say unbiblical, do, do you do you mean, I mean, how would you assess it, the engagement with the Bible here generally? Would you say that the Quran is polemically rescripting the stories of the birth of John and Jesus uh, in order to sort of erase from people's minds um, the, the account from the Gospel of Luke? Um, or do you think the Quran is sort of alluding to the Gospel of Luke and um, just adding on its own new interpretations? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a tough question to answer. I'm going to rely on um, a professor of mine uh, in undergraduate 
uh, Jack Tanous, who's been on the this show, um, and the idea of that the environment in which I I think these these things are being sort of proclaimed, recited, and uh, these arguments are being made is one of of of, of simple belief and of um, sort of imperfect knowledge. So I I would say that I I don't think that it has the Gospel of Luke as in the way that we understand it today in mind, right? As the text in the 27 books of the New Testament, that's, you know, with the, with, with the rest of the Bible. I, I, I think that these are, it's probably reacting to some sort of oral uh, environment. Um, and, you know, its relationship to the, to the material depends a lot on how you even source, like, where do you think the ultimate source of this material is? Is it, does it come from, so is there, does it have some sort of these traditions um, especially based on its poetic structure, like does part of the surah exist before the rest and how, you know, what would have been sort of the theological understanding of its composer? Um, why is the uh, sort of postscript added? Does it have like, are there, it, are the, the is it a unified, uh, does it have a unified theological outlook? I think these are sort of tough questions to answer mm -hmm. um, and I think bear on this question. Certainly, I think it's seek in the form that we have it today, um, and even I think more subtly in in the first thirty three verses here. I think it is seeking to sort of repurpose um, and respond to these uh, stories for its for a theological outcome. Ultimately, I think to make a connection between um, Muhammad or or the Quran and this previous uh, sort of prophetic tradition. Right. Um, and again, a lot of this bears on are there Christians in Mecca or not? Um, you know, was this uh, really recited before the king of Ethiopia, the Negus or not? Um, and these are questions that maybe a lot of them, I, I think we can answer <laughs> one of these. It does seem like Arabia is penetrated by monotheism and even Christianity much more than we had thought previously. Um, there's many videos on this channel that sort of go through that. But a lot of these other questions are very difficult to answer or are quite speculative. So maybe my long-winded answer here is we, we don't know for sure, but certainly I think that there is some sort of polemical or theological engagement here. Um, and ultimate, the, I would say the end of this, um, it, it, in, in the sense of it, the Aristotelian sense, the, the purpose of this is that um, it is to legitimize the sort of claims of the uh, the claims of, of of the prophet and 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 the um and this specific uh this new sort of movement so yeah on that very thoughtful reflection that might do it i mean so even, uh, i'll even go the, with the uh i'll go with the classical uh muslim commentators you know in the end Allah alam. <laughs> <laughs> well but one way to think about this is even if we haven't been speaking about muhammad specifically that even sort of medium in its sections on uh on mary jesus Zechariah, and john is also about muhammad in a way yeah. Uh, great. Yeah. Hassan, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Please um, take a moment to like this video. Thanks for being here. Leave a, um, a comment there and um, share, um, subscribe and share news of exploring the Quran uh, and the Bible far and wide. Thanks. Thanks, Hassan. Well, thank you, you, Professor.